Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's uh, keynote address from His Excellency Sakan Shimet, Prime Minister of Mongolia. My name is Helman Sitohang, and I'm the CEO for Credit Suisse here in Asia Pacific. Mongolia, one of the largest commodity exporting country in Asia Pacific, is a country rich in resource, culture, and identity. As one of the newer markets in Asia Pacific, it is becoming more open to international investment, and just last week raised a US dollar $500 million bond in what was its first US dollar bond since 2012, a transaction arranged by Credit Suisse. The country offers huge potential and is developing fast, but like many other countries across the region, faces challenges and headwinds. It must adapt to the slowdown in China's economic growth and a downturn in the commodity cycle. It has answered these challenges with some clear policies, which have started to improve business conditions and progress the major infrastructure projects that focus on supporting the country's economic development. His Excellency Sakhan Shilek Shimet has been at the helm of these initiatives. He has served as Prime Minister of Mongolia since November 2014, and prior to this, held a number of high-profile pos pro uh, positions, including Minister and Chief of Cabinet Secretariat for the Government of Mongolia, Leader of the Democratic Party, Caucasus in Parliament, and Minister of Education, where he was the youngest Cabinet Minister in Mongolian history. In this special address, His Excellency will discuss how the Mongolian government has implemented policies designed to recharge and diversify the country's economy and has opened up new opportunities to invest. Please join me in welcoming His Excellency Sakan Shilek Shimet, Prime Minister of Mongolia, to the Credit Suisse Asian Investment Conference. Thank you very much, Mr. Helman Stahan, for your very warm introduction. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, for any politician, it's the hardest job to involve attention during lunch through speech. But I'll try my best. And I'm pleased and honored to join you today in the Asian Investment Conference. On behalf of government of Mongolia, I wish to thank the Credit Suisse for inviting us here and for the warm welcome I have received so far during my visit. It's a pleasure to be here and have an opportunity to speak with you today. My message is a simple one. Mongolia is back and open for business. Although a simple message, many of you in this room know there is complexity. Uh, real complexity lying just under the surface of that single message. 2015 was a tough year for Mongolian economy. Failing commodities prices, weaker global demand, and slowing growth in China had significant effect on the country's economy. Yet, the government made progress on major mining and transport infrastructure projects which are expected to lay the foundations for near to mid-term economic recovery. At the outset, I want to highlight three key themes. Economy, the new normal, foreign investment, actions that are louder than promises, elections, stability in policy and governance. First, economy, the new normal. I know that many of you will appreciate that in democracy, and Mongolia's vibrant democracy, it's not always easy to get where you want to go directly. When we make mistakes, we are quick to fix them. My government's priority from day one was the economy, not the elections. I'm happy to reiterate my message to the investors here. I care about economy. As prime minister, it has been my priority to get Mongolia back into business. We have made significant changes to the laws that enable businesses to have simplification of dealing with government of Mongolia. 
foreign investors are giving the same protections as domestic invest, in, in, investors through changes in investment law, which removed requirements for prior governmental or parliamentary approval of equity investments in key sectors of Mongolia. In respect to transparent rule of law, sanctity of contracts, and free market principles, government of Mongolia recently settled an international arbitration decision with hung resources. The 70 million US dollar settlement is to be paid by May 2016. This action resolves the seven-year dispute over the conclusion, confiscation of high resources mining license and helps rebuild investor confidence in Mongolia. Also in February 2016, Mongolian parliament voted to proceed with Gatsurt gold mine, the 1.6 million ounce deposit developed by Toronto-based Sintera Gold Inc. Company after a five-year delay. The government of Mongolia is also closely engaged with private sector through PPPs in infrastructure and social sector projects to mobilize resources, knowledge, and expertise. The investment law, along with rules on procurement and concession law, has created a fairly level playing field for foreign and domestic private sector parties. We prepare so far 80 concession projects 22 of them are already under implementation. The remaining projects are awaiting their potential investors and concessionaries. Opportunities in Mongolia are not limited to the mining sector. Mongolia cannot now afford losing time, losing opportunities, and losing trust. Simply look at what we can potentially offer to the world. We are the 10th largest a reservoir of gold, copper, and coal. Mongolia has more than 56 million livestock and is the second biggest supplier of raw Kashmir in the world. We have mesmerizing opportunities for clean energy. 300 out 365 days are sunny with high solar radiation and endless source of solar energy. If you add up to wind energy, Mongolia can be the energy hub for the entire Asian continent. And our geographic location makes Mongolia a prominent investment destination, as we are located between one of the world's largest markets and largest populations, Russia and China. In order to realize this abundance of opportunities, it's important that we diversify investment into other sectors besides extractives. Thus, in 2014, our inbound investment has shifted considerably to non-mining industries such as agribusiness, healthcare, manufacturing, tourism, and others. The government of Mongolia plans to divest itself of many of its slate-owned entities in order to streamline government and improve the operations of the entities by subjecting them to market discipline. It adopted 2016 privatization program for full or partial privatization of some state-owned enterprises, major power stations, coal mines, Mongol Post, and Mongolian telecommunication are slated for privatization. Mongolia welcomes foreign participation in these efforts. The government of Mongolia also plans to reorganize Erdenes Mongol a state-owned investment enterprise into a holding company similar to the world-leading Singaporean Temasek. The company will receive 35 million US dollar technical assistance loan from, from Asian Development Bank for corporate restructuring. Ernest Mongol has also undergone international financial audit by one of the big four. Ernest Mongol is working with IFC to improve governance and policy standards, and with other IFIs to implement efficiency in procurement practices. Erdenes Mongol will manage government stakes in main sectors and major projects in country and to invest abroad. The company will be committed to improving the living standards of Mongolians, to adhere to best international business standards and practices. It will strive for transparency in corporate governance. Second, foreign investment actions that are louder than promises. 
Mongolia attracted more than 12 billion US dollar FDI during 2010-2013, of which more than half was related to oil total compromise first phase development. It's no secret that Mongolian economy is affected by decreasing FDI, coupled with China's slowdown and its impact on global commodity prices. We have passed proactive legislative steps to stabilize the economy while providing room for FDI and exports to recover. Positive growth has been maintained on the back of increased domestic investments and strong exports. In May 2015, one of the world's largest copper mines, Oyutalgo's shareholders, Iriotinto, Turkish Hill Resources and Government of Mongolia, agreed a plan to progress the next stage of underground development at Oyutalgo. The following December, a project financing agreement with 20 international banks and financial institutions to fund the development was signed. The 4.4 billion US dollar unlocked by the agreement will allow the construction of more than 200 kilometers of tunnels one mile deep underground. Following final board approvals, construction work is expected to begin this May. Oyutolgo having direct impact to the country's economy through FTI. The indirect impact of the project is also very significant. With more than 630 national businesses working with Oyutolgo in 2015, accounting for more than half of procurement spent. Mongolia is learning to cooperate with multinational companies and to construct the most competitive copper mine in the world. We also want to establish and to exercise best international mining and corporate practices in the country in order to set a precedent and standards for next similar undertakings. We believe the deal also demonstrates the government of Mongolia's support for the transparent rule of law, sanctity of contracts, and free market principles. The government is also looking to structure a commercially viable transaction that will optimize production and sales at Town Tolga Coke and Coal Field and power plant, amongst others, are expected to provide an additional boost to, to the Mongolian economy once negotiations are completed. This is the one of the world's largest untapped coal deposits with estimated reserves of about 6.4 billion tons. Third, elections, stability in policy and governance. Centuries-long unique traditions and culture, legendary history, and the warm-hearted people make Mongolia one of the most hospitable countries worth visiting at least once in a lifetime. This trio can be supplemented by another virtue of Mongols that is the most promising future of my richly endowed with natural resources country. Mongolians are peace-loving, open-minded, and immensely energetic people residing on a vast land of 1.5 million square kilometer. For centuries, since the establishment of the Great Mongol Empire by Lord Chinggis Khan in the 13th century, Mongols have maintained the rule of law, open foreign policies, consolidated diplomacy, and aspired cooperation to advance collective human prosperity. Having traveled long and uneasy journey of ruling and being ruled, Falling and rising, Mongolia arrived to where we are today. A vibrant and plural democracy, vocal social uh, civil society, and growing economy. The path to democracy and market economy was hard, often through bitter challenges, unintended mistakes, yet with rewarding lessons and encouraging achievements. In wrestling with her challenges and in crafting her success stories, Mongolia was not alone. Our strenuous efforts were tightly shouldered by the generous help of our friends throughout the world have offered to us. Last year, Mongolia observed the 25th anniversary of the first free and democratic election in Mongolia. The democratic revolution of 1990 opened unique opportunity for Mongolians to exercise their electoral rights and was in invaluable historical milestone in the political and legal life of Mongolia's population. Irrespective of their national identity, religion, social status, age, gender, or 
ideology. The people voluntarily elected their representatives from many parties through direct suffrage and secret ballot. Mongolia, with its varying geographical, natural, and cultural diversity, and with unequal location and distribution of voters to create an equitable voting opportunity for all electors that can ensure uniformity in the election process. In order to tackle these objectives, the Mongolian General Election Commission is successfully using the latest information and election technology, and for the first time in its history has fully automated election system. Thanks to this system, the election results are realistic. Mongolia now aspires to bring her own share of contribution to the global well-being, peace and prosperity. Mongolia wishes to reassure our friends that we can meaningfully blend into global affairs by creating the wealth of the world. Therefore, Mongolia announces open, fair, inclusive foreign economic policies through our trade and investment agenda. I do hope that our like-minded friends across the globe will embrace our policy for shared prosperity through engagement and mutually beneficial cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, Mongolia's roadmap for development is firm and clear. We will make, take robust, bold, brave actions to maintain the macroeconomic stability, prudent fiscal policies and enhanced debt management strategy, maintain trusted, responsible and fair cooperation with private investors, both domestic and foreign, ensure that our cooperation leads to win-win solutions and decisions. This year, Mongolia is taking an elevated responsibility to host the Asia Europa meeting, ASEM, in July 2016. The heads of 53 states will come to Mongolia for the first time. Hosting the ASEM is Mongolia's most significant contribution to the relations between the two continents. Historically, Mongolia used to be a bridge between these two continents. Now, we are once again becoming the bridge between the two continents in terms of railways and air routes. This meeting holds significance as it will strengthen these links further. In Mongolia, we have saying, trodden grass grows rich next year. Let us engage, let us work together to reap a rich harvest for our common, shared, inclusive prosperity. Thank you for your time and attention. I'd like to open the, the floor now for uh, questions, please. We have mics uh, across the room, so just please raise your hand. Mark. Thank you for that uh, wonderful talk. Uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, visiting your beautiful country, so it's really nice to have you here. Uh, on the sovereign wealth program you have, uh, in addition to that, do you plan to have a, a pension program? And the reason why I ask that uh, and related to that question is the development of the capital market, development of the stock market, the bond market, and uh, I wonder whether you have any plans for both those areas. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you uh, very much for your question. And uh, we succeeding uh, and succeeded in from this three field in foreign direct investment lot, and that's why we got a real boost in economic growth. During the last years, we sometimes approach 17.3% uh, uh, GDP growth per year. And also, we manage it also in involving foreign investors and uh, getting bonds and other activities from private sector and government. But the capital market is the area now government is really focusing on. And to establish this capital market and to reorganize our uh, Mongolian stock exchange with London Stock Exchange, that's uh, being one of the high priorities of our government. And regarding the uh, pension fund, uh, we recently also reorganized uh, our fund and also connected with uh, policies regarding mortgage plan. And this is the area also become a very hot subject right now for decision makers to proceed. And again, I also, during this visit, uh, I accompanied by Mr. Bimsah, and he's the CEO of our Erdenes Mongol. And we want to establish, as I said, Temasek like Singaporean 
company who is going to uh, combine all our state-owned companies and make it private uh, management company like uh, Temasek. And this is also a very important project we are working together. And the Asian Development Bank also engaged in these activities. And also we are asking other potential investors to make Mongolian Temasek in place. And uh, when we're establishing uh, this powerful tool, it's like Erdenes Mongol, it's Temasek. The next step for the government is making pension, through this pension plan and mortgage plans, we want to establish the real sovereign wealth fund. And only three million Mongolians with uh, plenty of natural resources. And uh, making this three, only three million people is a very inclusive approach, making it owners of this new sovereign wealth fund. That's the development effect for all Mongolians. And Mongolian government is after these policies right now. Next question, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that speech. Um, obviously, um, mining and agriculture are major parts of your uh, economy. Um, could you talk to us about how you would like to see the development of um, some of the services uh, sides of your economy, retail, etc.? Mm -hmm. uh, we call it in Mongolia uh, diverse question uh, uh, policy is rainbow policy, because rainbow consists of seven colors. And mining is only one of these seven colors. And um, there is a the huge potential for Mongolians to develop other six colors of this rainbow. And one of the first uh, areas, as you said, agriculture. And Mongolians, uh, as I said, we have 56 million livestock and we have 3 million population. We have 3 million horses and more than 25 million uh, lambs. And uh, we have most democratic livestock in the world. <laughs> Why we call it democratic? Because they're free to choose where to go and what to eat. <laughs> and this is really unique, Mongolian uniqueness, because 300,000 uh, people still having the, uh, this nomadic style of life. And uh, because of this uniqueness, our beef, lamb is most tasty, uh, uh, foods in the world, very organic, and some people from Credit Suisse, some uh, other people who visited us, really, uh, I hope that had opportunity to t taste these beautiful uh, lambs and beefs, and this is a huge potential also to make a new Mongolian brand. And as I also uh, said, uh, Mongolia is the second in the world in terms of raw Kashmir, and 30% of world reservoir is made by Mongols, and all these big brand names from Italy, uh, European Union, use our baby Kashmir and other Mongolian Kashmirs. And this is certainly area for rainbow economy. And the next area is tourism. And uh, Mongolia was very active. Uh, we uh, provided very proactive policy regarding tourism. And last year, we were uh, co-organizer of Berlin International ITB uh, exhibition. And this year, only 3 million, for example, 3 million Germans want to visit Mongolia. And uh, that's why tourism sector is a very good place. And in western part, we have very high mountains. And we have 16 uh, four, uh, peaks over 4,000 meters. That's a very good place to professional and uh, amateur climbers to climb. And also, we have very west step. And also, we have a very good uh, forest and lake area, like Switzerland in our north part. And uh, in one day, you can meet with Buddha, with uh, uh, Allah, with uh, uh, Christ in one day in Mongolia, because all this, you know, freely uh, by constitution, uh, we have also a national minority who is uh, Islam uh, province. And uh, it's a very democratic country, and that's why tourism is the, certainly one area, especially for ecotourism. You can go to countryside and visit a lot of interesting places, and uh, very uh, huge, very uh, rich history. And the next sector uh, is IT sector, and Mongolia is very good located between uh, Asia and Europe. And all these fiber optic networks connecting Hong Kong uh, with London also can be alternative route uh, through Mongolia, not uh, solely uh, uh, based on 
uh, routes uh, under the oceans. And this is the closest route connecting Europe with Asia. And that's why more pipelines, more uh, electric transmission systems, more railroads, more roads uh, can be built. We called it step road. And uh, there is also a huge potential for other industries to deal with it. And that's why we are calling this rainbow policy one of the uh, key areas for any government policies who's going to deal in the coming future. And mining sector now, it's about 80% of our economy and we want to decrease this number significantly. For that purpose, the other sector should deal properly. And again, for any investors who is interested in these sectors, we are more than happy to welcome all of them. Thank you. Um, to, to, to take that further, which, and thank you for the speech, which sectors do you see as having the most growth potential and uh, which require the most capital to actually exploit that potential? And how much of that, again, do you think would involve capital market activity? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a com uh, continuation of previous question. And uh, the uh, sectors I mentioned, I think it's very, uh, uh, has huge potential and plus zero center. And uh, I think uh, mining sector still will stay in uh, leading uh, sector for a while. But uh, if we will continue to look uh, in uh, Rio Tinto's strategy, uh, how they are investing in Mongolia, we are experiencing uh, during the late uh, period of time two big uh, crises. One was 2008-2010 financial uh, world uh, market crisis. And during this time, Rio Tinto started to invest into OTL OT as first phase. And they prepared during this uh, period of time. They invested, they built, reconstructed everything. And they started to get income from their investment during the last uh, three or four years. And now, during the uh, next uh, commodity uh, crisis, uh, difficulties, challenges, they are investing into second phase and preparing for next uh, cycle. And uh, after these rainy days will stop, in someday in the near future, they are also going to get uh, their uh, also fruits from this investment. And that's why I asking all of the companies act like Rio Tinto. And during this difficult uh, period of times, you should invest a lot. And when sunny days will emerge as mandatory uh, close, you can get more fruits from your investments. And that's why. We act like Credit Suisse in this regard, and uh, Credit Suisse being very uh, reliable, very close partner uh, for Mongolia, Mongolian government, and we really thankful for that uh, Credit Suisse doing. And we are other institutions, other investors also urging, requesting, act sim uh, similarly in this regard. And uh, also you asked about the capital uh, investments. I think uh, the most uh, profitable uh, sector will be infrastructure sector, I think. Because when trying to invest in Hong Kong right now in the infrastructure sector, it's really hard to find some kind of projects in this case. In Mongolia, it's like white paper with a lot of potential land. The, from China, from Beijing on plane, we just spending one and a half hour and approaching to Hong Kong four hours and approaching the West uh, Siberian and Russian area. It's also just a couple of hours of flight. And that's why this uh, geographical location, I think, and investing in infrastructure, and even the Russians now are asking us to expand our railroad because they want to expand the oil products transportation through Mongolia and other uh, transportations uh, for these certain products. And that's why investing in infrastructure in Mongolia right now is the most important uh, sector and most profitable sector, I think. And the uh, government is invested a lot and also we pay with a lot of roads and uh, on the uh, verge of also starting two, three uh, big railroad projects and that's why this is the area certainly any investor will look after uh, very considerably. Thank you. Thank you for your speech. 
I just want to ask two questions. One is, is there any firm timetable to develop Tawatagoi coal mine project? The second one is, there is a Mongolian company called the Mongolian Mining Corporation, which is currently in restructuring talks with its bondholders and uh, uh, bank lenders. Uh, is there any possibility for the Mongolian government to provide liquidity support or any favorable policy to help the company to survive, to preserve its listing status in Hong Kong. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, for regarding TT uh, project, uh, Ertenus Mongol is dealing with this project and government right behind uh, Ertenus Mongol to succeed with TT. Right now, we somehow in standby mode because of uh, one of the participants of this project, Mongolian local company, MMC, as you're saying, is under restructuring uh, their debt situation and uh, other issues. We're waiting for them to finalize its internal issues. And right after they finalize with uh, this situation, government is ready to commence its activities. And as you're saying, for any government, and uh, when your local company, one of the leading companies also uh, interfering with some kind of difficulties, challenges, government is, of course, uh, willing to assist in any meaning. And that's why if they will ask government to interfere with uh, their situation, government will be ready. If they can do it by themselves, that's fine. And as soon as they get through these uh, processes, we are ready to commence TT negotiations. And also Chinese investor is also involved in this uh, project. And when uh, everybody is ready for next phase of negotiation process, government will be ready. Mm -hmm. Next question. Hi, uh, thank you for your speech. Um, you mentioned infrastructure being the most important and most profitable sector and you mentioned a couple of railroads, um, but I was also wondering what other forms of infrastructure um, would, be, uh, would be looked into and whether this would be government funded mainly or if it would be opened up to uh, the market, private, private financing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, besides of uh, infrastructure sector development in railroad, there is plenty of uh, areas any investor can look after, and construction sector, for example, because uh, government, through its policy, we started three years ago a big uh, mortgage plan, and 76,000 uh, uh, households went already to new households, newly uh, constructed buildings, and uh, this policy is now ongoing, and mortgage plans also, uh, the conditions of mortgage plans is also getting uh, better for citizens' households. And that's why involving in construction sector is the, certainly one area to engage with. And also a lot of uh, factories is also waiting, and especially in construction site and uh, iron products, iron products, and also cement factories. And certainly these areas will be also covered in uh, terms of investment. It's also good areas to invest. And also one area also I really look forward that government of Mongolia is also taking into account. We want to introduce new service entertainment uh, sector of economy. And after successfully organizing a same meeting, we want to uh, develop uh, through all this state tourism. And Mongolia is now one of the uh, Mongolia is now a member of 160 different international organizations and every month or so, as like Hong Kong, we want to host many international events, for example. And new casino law, new entertainment law, new uh, uh, betting law on epidrome, uh, horse racing laws also submitted to the parliament. And also good big shopping center with casino, so just next to our new international airport is also Right now, it's ongoing. Uh, big uh, project is now ongoing, and at the end of this year, we're going to open our new international airport. And just to next to this international airport, we want to introduce new casino, new uh, hippodrome, and new so shopping centers. And also, one uh, area uh, we also very <coughs> interested in is that movie uh, industry sector and. Uh, Mongolian Hans Empire's uh, topic is now one of the hot topics in Hollywood 
and Marco Polo just also uh, contacted with the government of Mongolia and we uh, helped and also participate in the second season and we hope that third and fourth season of Marco Polo and other uh, movies from Hollywood, Netflix will be also shoot in uh, Mongolian soil and that's why new movie uh, sector, new movie industry, it's one of the area for our rainbow economy as well. Hi, uh, Mongolia raised uh, $1.5 billion in, in bond issuance back in 2012. Can you talk about how that money was spent and what's been built with it? Uh, of course, it was our first experience and uh, we uh, invested in heavily in the infrastructure sector and also in the industrialization sector. And uh, we, uh, government will fulfill all its obligations on a five year, 10 years. Uh, basis, all these Chinggis bonds uh, obligations. And also government looking for more uh, opportunities like this one because this is really giving us big boost to provide economic growth, to provide the necessity of economy and society to invest in infrastructure and other sectors. And uh, we will be in pretty good shape to uh, proceed with uh, all these obligations and bond requirements. I have maybe one, one question. I think, uh, you know, obviously with, uh, with the kind of uh, diversification from the mining sector uh, going to tourism and, you know, the IT, et cetera, obviously, I think the development of the human resources is obviously critical for that to be able to achieve that. Maybe you can uh, um, explain how you kind of uh, developing that part as well so then you can have, uh, you know. Uh, yes, booty. when we uh, develop uh, one uh, major project, we always imply that and uh, behind this one uh, major project, there is the huge uh, potential to invest in our people. And mm -hmm. human factor is the most important thing. And the government is uh, now paying all tuition fees for our students. If you enrolled in 20 uh, leading universities in the world colleges, and we pay 100% tuition fees. And if you enrolled in uh, 70 uh, biggest uh, colleges and <coughs> uh, other schools, also, government, uh, the half of tuition fees also government providing for Mongolia students. Also, with Japanese government, we are providing a, a project, uh, 1,000 engineers, and uh, our engineers in uh, different areas also, we send them to Japan to get uh, their engineering uh, schools, high uh, education uh, institutions. And, uh, for example, when we started with Oyutolgo, the mostly foreigners started with this project. Now 95% of all uh, working force is consisted of Mongolians and new engineers is also emerging and a lot of uh, uh, learning process mm -hmm. uh, also going on. And also these companies, these projects is investing very heavily in our professional training institutions. And uh, I just last week visited in countryside one of these schools and with heavy techniques, uh, equipments, and a lot of computer uh, simulators is also on uh, place now. And a lot of Mongolian local guys also experiencing learning uh, all this, uh, 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 all this, uh, techniques uh, from this kind of activities. And that's why human resource investment, human resource development, uh, when we're talking about it, we're not only talking about economy investment, we're not only talking about some particular investment, but always behind it, human development. And that's why we really after this kind of investment, because know-how, technology, financial uh, power bring us also uh, opportunity to develop our human resources. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? And and again, uh, as I said, uh, we just not telling that Mongolia is the ultimate place to invest. We just uh, telling is Mongolia is best country, but we are trying to show it through our actions, and yeah. that's why government making. In terms of policy, difficult decisions, but in terms of business, in terms of investment, we always, uh, there is the very firm belief that we are uh, making uh, right decisions. And that's why Mongolia will support 
and government will behind any investors and we are always welcoming any involvement from business community, investment community and there won't be any uh, different approach from uh, to any investors and we are going to tr treat them equally as our local uh, investors and we are looking forward to some good collaboration and one of uh, many of you will be uh, visit us in coming uh, months, years and certainly you can find a reliable partner in terms of Mongolian local companies and also we'll discover uh, new Mongolia for yourselves and everybody who is willing to come to Mongolia, uh, come to invest in Mongolia will benefit from win-win principles. This is our strong belief and you all uh, who attended here this luncheon uh, organized by Credit Suisse, all of you have uh, please consider that all of you have Prime Minister's invitation to visit Mongolia. Thank you very much. <laughs>